So this November, we're going to be able to explore the Hullabaloo Circus side story that will likely follow the events of Manor Game 8, with Soul Weaver, Acrobat, Joker, Female Dancer, and Wildling. While we already have a pretty good idea about the circumstances of this game and its outcome, I'm excited to play through the story later this year. But for that reason, I'll let the story tell itself and move on to discussing what comes next. But I will say, justice for Soul Weaver. If you do want a little summary video before it releases, let me know in the comments though, because it might be nice to know what to expect. Anyway, after another chapter in the main story, Identity 5 developers confirmed recently that the next side story will be Game Zero, and that they will alternate releases between main story and side stories in the future. What is Game Zero though? Well, beyond being the first Manor game, it was the attempt at a control group for the Manor's experiments gone horribly wrong. Given the Mind's Eye's significant involvement in this game, it's already near and dear to my heart. So in this video, I'll go over what we know about the game, what we don't, and what I think we may see in the side story. Before we get into the events of the game though, I'll give a brief summary of what brings all of our players to the manor, then we can go over what we know happened for a fact, and how I think we can fill in the gaps. First, we have to go over the significance of serial numbers, otherwise labeled step numbers, which are the numbers by which characters are labeled in their experiments. Most of these are three numbers separated by dashes. The first number signifies the number of the experiment group or manor game that the subject is taking part in. The second number seems to be a binary 0 or 1, with 1 noting a significant result from the application of drugs, the intervention, and 0 being no application or noticeable effect. The last number is likely the subject's unique placement within the experiment which could also be an order of arrival to the manor game. So let's start with the first subject who is speculated to be 010, Orpheus. Now Novelist is a uniquely confusing character to explore, mainly because his fragmented identities make his motives and timelines quite confusing. What we do know about Novelist at this time is that he grew up at the Olitas Manor either as an adopted son or sponsor of the Duras family, and was childhood friends with the Duras' daughter, Alice. After a raid on the manor, both children were left orphans and were forever haunted by the trauma of that night. To cope with his trauma, Orpheus began writing novels based on his life experiences, with one of his first being The Reaper's Flute, or The Flute of Death, referencing a piccolo he played as a child that was also used by the bandits to trick the manor into opening their doors and allowing their murderous spree. This piccolo was sent to novelist in an invitation alongside hints at the culprit behind the raid on the manor which might be his real parents? Now again, this backstory is told from an unreliable narrator, so we have to take it with a grain of salt. Given Orpheus may be involved in the manor game experiments himself, we just have to keep his fragmented identities in mind for this manor game. Anyway, suspiciously enough, his order in the game is zero, meaning he was probably already at the manor up to nothing good. Next is confirmed to be subject 001, the psychologist Ada Mesmer. Born into a family of doctors with successful psychiatrist Charles Mesmer as her father, Ada Mesmer grew up with all the resources necessary to flourish in the field of psychology. And that she did. Ada became a near prodigy in her field and broke the glass ceiling in terms of exceeding society's limited expectations on what women could achieve as medical professionals. Given Ada's experience in defying expectations and holding her convictions amongst doubt and dismissal, it's no surprise Ada would have the confidence to explore the controversial practice of hypnotherapy. Her convictions, however, garnered so much doubt and controversy that she was expelled from her position as a teacher of psychology. This, however, only motivated Ada to make strides in her research and prove the doubters wrong, all while making a genuine effort to heal those of their past traumas. Given the opportunity to work with patients at the White Sands Street Asylum, Ada signed a temporary contract to test her methods. While her method seemed to alleviate some of the pain in many of the patients, Ada saw the most progress with a patient named Emil. Although Ada's contract neared its end, Ada felt Emil's treatment was unfinished, and a strong attraction to him left her desperate to continue her sessions with him. Moreover, he was the best evidence to her that her methods were in fact effective, affirming her beliefs in the practice of hypnotherapy. Around this time, novelist Orpheus wrote to Ada about potentially receiving a list of patients from the asylum likely for a lead toward Alistair Ross, under the guise of needing inspiration for his novels, and caught Ada stealing patient files herself. Not only did Ada reject the novelist's request and refer him to her father instead, but she denied stealing patient files, likely Emile's, and stated her plan to take a leave from her position to focus on family. 
Well, soon after, Ada experienced some setbacks in her treatment of Emil, with him losing focus and spasming from her medicine-assisted hypnotherapy session. Emil's remorse of his condition, but gratitude toward Ada for their time together, brought Ada to realize that not only was he her true love, someone that believed in her efforts, but that she would exhaust all options for a chance at alleviating his pain. Ada then received an invitation to the manor with a promise that in return for the list, he would help Ada in further treating Emil and returning him to a state of autonomy. So, with the stolen files stowed away, Ada broke Emil out of the asylum, eventually landing at the manor to fulfill her side of the promise, and enter Emil into the experiment that would hopefully treat the symptoms of his past trauma. With that, we have confirmed Subject 002, the patient, Emil. Emil was born into an impoverished and heavily abusive household, and with three siblings, food and resources were scarce between them. One day, a curious Emil snuck into the dogfighting pit his father illegally racketeered. The spectators were sadistically amused by Emil's torture from the bloodthirsty hounds, tearing and clawing at him in the pit, leading to increased profits for his father. Emil's father, driven by these new profits, treated Emil like one of his hounds, locking him in a cage until he was forced into further rounds of dogfighting. While guards fortunately busted the illegal operation, Emil was left in an almost feral state and sent to the White Sand Street Asylum for treatment. What Emil experienced at this asylum was not much more humane though, shocked and prodded much like an animal. Although Emil forgot most of his past, he remembered only pain and that the only way to survive in life was through obedience. It wasn't until Ada Mesmer's hypnotherapy sessions that Emil knew what it felt like to be treated as a human. Ada's treatment was twofold, hypnotherapy and empathy. As sessions progressed, Emil was able to connect with emotions and aspects of his autonomy better, but the increasing resurfacing of his past trauma caused him to suffer panic attacks that Ada felt progressively powerless in alleviating. Although there was still an odd feeling of being an accessory to Ada, her treatment of Emil was far better than anyone before, and the fact that she cared for Emil beyond his torturous past made Emil feel the genuine love in her effort to give him a better future. Of course Emil would follow Ada anywhere, including out of the asylum and to the strange manner that promised to end his suffering. Next, and my favorite, is Subject 003, which is later corrected to 013, but we'll discuss that later. The Mind's Eye, Helena Adams. Not long before her second birthday, Helena Adams faced a disease that would alter the course of her life. Much like meningitis or measles, Helena developed a high fever and, like in some rare cases, significant loss of eyesight. Helena's father still considered her the perfect treasure of his life though, and would do anything to help her cope with this, gifting her a cane for use as a mobility aid. At first, it was difficult for Helena to adapt with a significant change in her life, but it was through education that she would find new inspiration. Helena's father would hire her a teacher, Miss Sullivan, who would help Helena learn braille, etiquette, and literary techniques. At first, even Helena's father admitted surprise at the talent Helena possessed and her artful way of crafting poetry. However, he questioned just how embellished some of her work seemed. Sullivan set out to make Helena a prodigy, a miracle, and in doing so, had Helena exaggerate her difficulties, such as feigned deafness to draw wonder at Helena's brilliance. While Helena was thankful for Sullivan's guidance and instruction, she felt conflicted and lost as she wasn't expressing full authenticity in her work. In wanting to live an honest life, Helena states, Do the words we speak and the paragraphs we write come from what we've heard, or do they come from our own thoughts and experiences? Although it was Helena's dream to be a successful writer, she wondered if she would find success on her own, with works authentically expressing her own thoughts and feelings. An invitation to a conference at the Olitas Manor was, in Helena's view, an opportunity to do just that, test her literary prowess seemingly away from Sullivan's influence, and so she made off to the manor. And last, speculated to be subject 004, is sculptor Galatea Claude. Galatea was born into a family of artists, but being born with skeletal dysplasia, her parents were cautioned about the physical and mental effects that she was likely to face later in life due to her permanently short stature. Sure enough, while practicing sculpting in Florence, her successes were emphasized by the fact she was perceived as a little girl, but her failures were compounded by this patronizing perception of immaturity and inexperience. It was this naivete that ended Galatea's apprenticeship and she was sent home to search for newfound inspiration. An invitation offering Galatea the opportunity to work under commission from Mr. de Ross 
was the perfect chance for finding this new inspiration. Now Galatea is said to leave and return to the manor later on, and there's more of her backstory to be told, but for reasons I'll elaborate later in my speculation, I personally believe that this, the first invitation, was when Galatea participated in the control group, or Game Zero. So I'll end the summary here and explain my thoughts on the timing later on. Now that we have our participants all in search of some sort of inspiration, let's discuss the facts of what happened in Game Zero as they're told directly from letters and deductions. Only after reviewing these facts will I begin my own speculation, which, of course, may deviate from what is revealed later on, because again, it's only my speculation. So what we know of Game Zero derives mostly from the Mind's Eye, Sculptor, and Psychologist birthday letters. First, we know that experimenters drugged 010, the novelist, with unreasonable doses in the early phase of the game, then gave 003, the Mind's Eye, a more reasonable dosage. She seemed to be the new focus of the experiment, given she was, what experimenters thought, the perfect control due to her capacities of self-awareness and maturity. They observed how early on, Helena showed excessive compassion and care towards 004, Galatea, as she perceived them both as lambs in her 2021 letter. Helena writes, Just like any story about adventures, things didn't go well in the beginning. That seminar wasn't even fair, which made me anxious. Until I met that child, we're so much alike, both of us are trapped in a muse's cage, yet we're so much different. Despite that, I wanted nothing more. I could never be as candid as she is to myself. Helena also extended kindness to Novelist and considered him an ally. Helena was, however, wary of 001, the psychologist Ada Mesmer, as she seemed too mysterious and arrogant. This attitude is reflected in Ada's 2023 secret letter, writing, Dear Mr. Novelist, I demand that the experiment be terminated immediately. Although I agreed to let Emil assist you, his safety cannot be guaranteed now that his identity has been exposed. I do not see any of the security personnel you promised, and I repeatedly hinted at our cooperation to you today, yet you seem to have no intention of discussing it with me. It would seem your reputation alone cannot guarantee our safety, so I would rather give up the payment and leave with Emil. Please reply to this as soon as possible. We shall be leaving in the evening tomorrow if we don't hear from you. Otherwise, according to experimenters, Helena's excessive compassion affected her otherwise sane mind and led her to making incorrect judgments in extreme situations. One extreme situation seems to be explored in Galatea's 2022 letter, where Helena writes, Dear Galatea, how are you? You locked yourself in after returning to your room early in the morning. You refused to say anything, and all we could hear was incessant yet faint banging. Please talk to me. I'm very worried about you. You must be frightened. No one expected it to go the way it did, but Mr. Orpheus did it to protect himself and us. Just like how you immediately pushed me aside when we were attacked. Don't be afraid, Galatea. I'll never leave your side. I will protect you and we'll leave this place together. Please be sure to call me if you've calmed down or need anything. One last thing. When we returned last night, we discovered that his corpse was gone, but Mr. Orpheus denied ever cleaning it up. I have a bad feeling. Anyway, please be careful when you're alone. This situation is mirrored in Helena's 2022 letter. When he picked up the hunting rifle, I uncovered the truth of fear. When you found the whistle, I touched the mask of goodwill. When I entered the study, I knew the truth of human nature. Nearing the end of the game, Helena writes a summary of her experience in her 2021 letter. Perhaps this will be the last entry of my records. While I never found my answers about creation here, my experiences will serve as an infinite source of inspiration going forward. Just like any story about adventures, things didn't go well in the beginning. That seminar wasn't even fair, which made me anxious. Until I met that child, we're so much alike. Both of us are trapped in a muse's cage, yet we're so much different. Despite that, I wanted nothing more. I could never be as candid as she is to myself. She reshaped me, just like Sullivan did back then. They showed me the light at the end of a misty journey. And as a winner who's crossed the finish line, I'll leave this place tomorrow with my reward and continue with my pursuit. I'll no longer be lost this time around. The end of the game may be better explained in her 2023 letter though. Now, Gala, the game is at its end. When we push open the door that puts an end to all nightmares, what will we see behind it? Will it be the real you or the real me? There are bloodstains at the edges of the piece and an Italian phrase written in an exaggerated cursive below it Muse number three. According to experimenters, Helena gradually fell into Galatea's trap and became the only punisher in the game. When the truth was exposed, 
The shock from the cognitive deviation and immense guilt shattered Helena's protective shell for her personality. This seemed to have created an ideal experiment for the drug, yet the results of the experiment were far from what they had expected. Now we know for a fact that Novelis successfully survives this game, as he appears in numerous future games, including those of the current main storyline. Given the other subjects' lack of evident participation in future games as of yet, we can't be 100% certain of their fates, but this is where I'll try and fill in those gaps. But before we do that, if you're an Identity 5 nerd, you're probably wondering why I haven't brought up one of Identity's most mysterious documents, the Closet Diary. Many players believe that the Closet Diary that the players receive in the game's tutorial holds three entries from a participant of Game Zero, narrating its events. Therefore, I'll be providing two scenarios of how I think Game Zero played out, one with the Closet Diary and one without. First, we know that the Closet Diary can't be written by Ada or Emil, given they're talked about in the third person, meaning also that the order number 001 doesn't necessarily coordinate with arrival at the manor, given the first to arrive is another female participant. Given that Helena's visual impairments make her less likely to see a guy escaping the manor, and her literary skill makes her less likely to make numerous spelling errors in the diary, the likely author is Galatea. However, I find it odd that the other participant says, Everyone is here for the treasure, but no one knows what that is, or doesn't want to disclose that information, when it seems everybody in this game had pretty clear intentions about why they traveled to the manor, that aren't really confidential, nor are best described as treasure. Anyway, the most significant part of this document is when the author states, I saw someone leave the house through a window on the second floor this afternoon. I just could not figure out who it was in the cloak. That, however, is not my concern. And on the next day, a short note instructed us to gather in the dining room before breakfast, and notified us that tragedy had struck that young couple. The boyfriend had died. The reason that was given for the elimination was an infraction of the rules. Maybe it had something to do with the man in the cloak? That poor girl was crushed and couldn't stop crying. Perhaps it is times like this that increases the sense of hopelessness. This sense of despair spread amongst us, snatching our voices from us. But in that silence, I sense that somebody isn't all that distraught. So, the main reason people think that this closet diary belongs to a Game Zero participant is because of the young couple, and Ada and Emil are really the only young couple identity has confirmed so far. The main reason people think this can't be Game Zero is because in the game, when a participant is killed by Orpheus' shotgun, Helena states, We discovered that his corpse was gone. Therefore, the deceased must be the only other male participant, Emil. But in the closet diary, the boyfriend of the couple seems to be eliminated for an infraction of the rules, to most of the participants' surprise, two contradictory events. However, there is a way for the closet diary to still be canon. Something that stuck out to me about Ada's perspective is the fact that in her 2023 letter to Novelis, she states, Although I agreed to let Emil assist you, his safety cannot be guaranteed now that his identity has been exposed. So, why was Emil's identity hidden, and why is he assisting Novelist? Was he the man in the cloak, escaping through the second story window? I mean, it'd be possible given his grappling ability, and definitely seems like an infraction of rules, especially as Ada was already threatening to leave the game. I also find it odd how Emil isn't really explained for in any of the Game Zero letters. Maybe his early elimination necessitated a replacement, which has happened in future games. Then, Novelist wouldn't be distraught, given he certainly played a role in Emil's death, either coercing him or revealing him breaking the rules. Anyway, the game seems to really escalate on the last day, midnight after Bells, when they meet in the ruins. Here, Emil's replacement attacks the girls, with Galatea pushing Helena out of the way and Orpheus shooting the attacker, killing him. The group all return to the manor, with Galatea locking herself in her room. Helena, Orpheus, and Ada go back out only to find the corpse to be missing, and Helena leaves a note under Galatea's door, telling her to be careful. Sculptor's incessant yet faint banging, however, is probably her sculpting a new head onto the stolen corpse's body, as it becomes her new inspiration. Later, probably in the last stage of the game, Galatea finds Ada's whistle and gives it to Helena, showing a facade of concern for Ada's safety. In reality, Galatea likely killed Ada and added her to the corpse sculpture collection in the study. When Helena discovers the sculptures, she snaps, realizing Galatea's betrayal, and goes to confront her. While the drugs succeed in causing Helena to seek revenge against Galatea, the fact that she never loses her anchor between good and evil, she's resistant to the drugs overall, and fails in punishing the sculptor. The experimenters reason that this is probably due to the instability and insufficiency of the medicine, or Helena's just too good-natured. Instead, Galatea likely turns the mind's eye, 
Helena Adams into her most inspired sculpture so far. Muse number 3. The slightly raised arm and frail body form a peculiar silhouette, one akin to the unfinished sculpture at the end of the corridor. Namely, there were two genuine sculptures of the Muse Tepsichore in different poses, and a near-perfect counterfeit of Calliope. For a set of sculptures to contain two of the same figure is a rare sight indeed. Generally, this is only the case when a piece is lost during the sculpting process, forcing the artist to complete the original set with a new replacement. As for the counterfeit, her only imperfection is one that was left by her creator, and can only be noticed by those who are capable of perceiving the truth of art. Galatea left the manor with the inspiration she was looking for, a distorted view of perfection derived from feelings of unjust inadequacy. She would dedicate her life to creating perfection that her creator robbed her of. She would create Galatea as she wanted to be, a tall, elegant female body with her innocent face plastered on. Taking volume 10 of Ovid's The Metamorphoses from the manor's study, Galatea likely resonated with the passage, Indeed, art hides his art. He marvels and passions, for this bodily image consumes his heart. Often, he runs his hands over the work, tempted as to whether it is flesh or ivory, not admitting it to be ivory. Eventually, Galatea's father caught her conversing with the sculpture once again. Her furious father picked up the sculpture and threw it off the terrace. Galatea jumped after her creation without hesitation, the cause of her hemiplegia. She was then sent to the White Sand Street Asylum, where she would make a sculpture from the corpse of her female caretaker, the technique she learned from her time at the manor. Later, she would befriend another patient, a cheerleader, and would return once more to the manor games. Novelist too survived his time in the manor, but remained participating in numerous manor games, up until the present Ashes of Memory story, his identity being further fragmented and memories shattered after each game. But if we're to assume that the Closet Diary is not Game Zero or too outdated, we have to make a few changes. So first, Novelis is given an unreasonable dose of drugs, and Helena the normal amount for the intervention, throughout the game. Early on, Helena shows compassion to and becomes close allies with Galatea, who she perceives to be in the same situation as her, bright young women with physical disabilities and seeking inspiration, but is wary of overbearing Ada Mesmer. Somewhere in the conversation, Emile is revealed to also be a patient of Ada, who responds to Ada's whistle. This vulnerability has Ada concerned for Emile's safety, and threatens novelist that she'll leave the game, taking Emile with her. The participants are ordered outside to play the game, and Sculptor in some way, shape, or form finds Emile's whistle, possibly from killing Ada earlier, likely using it to antagonize him into attacking, or getting Helena to. Galatea pushes Helena out of the way to seemingly protect her, but further manipulating her as an ally, and Orpheus shoots a panicked Emile with a shotgun, seemingly to protect them all. The remaining subjects, minus Galatea, return to find Emile's body, only for it to be missing, and Helena leaves a note under Galatea's door telling her to be careful, given Emile's corpse is missing, only for Sculptor's incessant yet faint banging, being her sculpting a new head onto Emile's body, as she does with her muses. Much like in the other story, Helena eventually discovers Galatea's betrayal and snaps trying to avenge the victims. Now, I do find it kind of strange that Helena is mentioned as the only Punisher in the game, when Orpheus is known to kill someone, and Galatea likely did too. Therefore, the role of Punisher must also be correlated with the effects of drugs or the objective of their game. Does this mean Mind's Eye's Hunter Swap confirmed? Mm, not necessarily. Usually Hunters are the perceptions of survivors from others who are drugged, but so is Novelist in this game. For example, this could also be where Galatea's Hunter form derives. Maybe her accident and institutionalization was before this game too, but I still find it odd she's not a Punisher then. Anyway, Helena may still see a hunter form regardless, given she is said to confront Galatea, albeit likely unsuccessfully. Overall, given Ada, Emile, and Helena don't appear nor are hinted to appear in any future manor game or future setting, it's likely that Novelist and Sculptor really are the only survivors of Game Zero. I wish that Helena's talk of crossing the finish line meant she escaped and lived happily ever after, but I can't shake that she confronted Sculptor and became Muse number 3. As more birthday letters release and the story date nears, I'm sure we'll have a much clearer picture about the events of this wild, failed control group, and it's definitely my most anticipated manor game so far. Let me know what you think about Game Zero, or what manor game you hope we can explore later in the future. Also, if there's a manor game you want me to cover, let me know in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching, and happy hunting.